here's the difference between an exceptional broker and an okay broker is any broker like two days out of the out of the licensing course can save you 0.1%. Yeah. That's easy. But a really exceptional broker is going to be able to find you. It's so easy. Welcome back to the Real Estate 100 show. This is the episode on how to get a mortgage. We're going to walk you through step by step the mortgage process in Canada and how to basically go from living in your parents' basement to getting a mortgage and then ultimately renewing it one day down the road because that's something that comes along with getting a mortgage. Five years after you get it, you have to go and renew it and get another one. That's uh, part of getting a mortgage in Canada. So we're going to take you through the whole process step by step. I have Miles Noick with me today from the Noick Mortgage team out in Nanaimo. Of course, I'm Nolan Mathias. Are people still getting mortgages out there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the market's, uh, you know, we're swinging into the market's opening up a bit and things are going a bit crazy and we've seen some more stability. So, you know, of course... First, a lot of first-time buyers jump back off the fence trying to get back into that market. Yeah, totally. Realizing that the sky is not going to fall all the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, this it's this one of those things that I think we've talked about this on other episodes of the uh, of the show where we talked about the best time to buy is is when you're ready and when you feel like you are, can make a long-term decision that you'll be able to support financially, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's um that's I, I always have people and they always ask me about trying to time the market and I've always told people it's impossible. You know, I mean, I, I work in the industry. I'm pretty sure I said this on an episode too. Like I've been working in mortgages for almost 10 years now and I've been in the industry for over 12. And when I bought my last house, I timed the market perfectly, but on the wrong side of it, <laughs> you know, I mean, and now I'm looking at, I mean, it's okay. Things happen, but like, that's, that's the reality of it. There's no guarantees. There's no crystal ball. Like I'm not greedy. If I had a crystal ball, it's not, I don't want to see five years in the future. I just want like three months, but doesn't exist so you can't really try and bank everything on trying to time things perfectly because nothing will ever happen the way you think it will yeah totally in essence, that, in essence right so. totally and I, i've done the same thing i talked about the first condo i bought in one of the other episodes and how i sold it thinking you know fresh out of university with an economics degree thinking this thing can't go any higher it's going to go down and then i missed out on the on the biggest six-month run in calgary history and it cost me about $150,000 because I thought I was selling it at the top and I was nowhere close to the top. Yeah. Right? So I think that's the first thing we got to talk about is, and and I think we just did is talking about, you know, not trying to time the market and, and just getting ready. But I think the next part of that is that age old question of renting versus buying. So I'm going to pose this one to you, Miles. What's your thoughts on renting versus buying? Buy a house buy or a, house. a condo. Buy. Just always yeah. buy. Uh, that's the, you know what that's I've been raised by a mortgage broker. My grandmother was a mortgage broker. My dad's a mortgage broker. Um, most of the people I associate myself with are mortgage brokers. So I mean, one could say that yes, I'm biased with it. Like you know, buy a house because I want to finance it and my job carry on. But at the same time, once again, it's something we've talked about before in previous episodes: is the net worth of people who own versus rent and. One thing I've always sort of looked at, and I'm not afraid to tell any person this, if you are renting a house, when you have the ability to buy it, you're essentially burning money. Mm -hmm. You might as well take the money, take it outside, light a fire pit and start tossing it in there. Because yeah. if you're paying rent, you're paying someone else's mortgage, you're not paying your own. If you're paying your own, I mean, right now with higher interest rates, yeah, you're paying more interest than principal, but you're still paying principal. And that's the key behind it. You're building equity, you're building for savings, you're building value. Which you can't do that if you're renting. No, absolutely. And I mean, the, and the data is pretty clear on this, and I'm just trying to pull it up here, but there's this, Stats Canada has the actual data on people who, and their net worth over, over a period of time in here. I found it, so let me just add it in here. And it's staggering, right? It's, um, you've got people who are, who are renting versus owning a home. Okay, so here it is. There the it rising is. home prices seen in parts of the country can lead to wealth gains for homeowners. According to the Survey of Financial Security, the net worth of homeowners of all ages rose from 323,000 in 1999 to 685,000 in 2019. In comparison, the net worth of renters of all ages rose from 14,000 to 24,000. So, yeah. I mean, that's pretty staggering, right? Homeownership versus renting. It's yep. six hundred eighty-five thousand dollars versus twenty-four thousand. So, you know, when I look at this, 
type of data and I look at the numbers, you know, I sit there and I think the, the most important thing that somebody can do is to get into a home as soon as possible because there is this trap that can happen if you find yourself in a situation where you have to be renting for a long period of time. And I think that's what's happened with a lot of people right now is they've, they've found themselves in a situation where they rented for too long in some of the really expensive markets. And now they've priced themselves out of the market yep. because they have a family, they have two kids, they need a house, but they yeah, can't they're... afford a house because they didn't take that stepping stone from a condo or a townhouse to an actual house, right? Yeah, and that's that's one thing I always tell people too is like, um, you know, my first house, I use that as an example every time because crummy neighborhood, old house, you know, definitely not like the house that you look at and go, gee, this is an amazing place where I want to raise my family. No, it was a starter home. Mm -hmm. It got my foot in the door, allowed me to build equity. I utilized that equity to buy the house I'm in now in a much nicer neighborhood and a much better house. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a stepping stone. I think you're so right. I think there are people, they get to a point where it's like, I have to skip a couple of steps to move forward. And to do that is costly. And, you know, I mean, there are people that have things that can help with that. But there are some people that can't. And that's where you run into some issues. But I also think there is, um, I'm not sure how to word it. But, you know, I mean, one thing I tell people is your first house is not your forever home. No one mm -hmm. buys their forever home on the first purchase. It's always a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. Always, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. when I bought my first place, my parents looked at it and said, wow, that's an ugly house. My grandmother said, wow, that's a dump. And I looked at it and said, but it's my ugly house and it's my dump, you know, and it built equity over time, increased in value. And I wouldn't be where I am financially if I didn't make that purchase. Totally. You know, it's uh, you get your foot in the door is the totally. key. Getting in the door. That's, totally. that's your first step. Yeah. And I think it's obvious, like there's certain times where renting makes sense. So if you know you're not going to yep. be in a city for a large period of time, if you know that you're just moving out of the house for the first time, you know, and, and you're going to get some roommates and whatnot, and you kind of want to yep. feel out living on your own totally. But, you know, I think everyone young or older who doesn't own a home should be thinking with the intent that I'm going to at some point be moving out Absolutely. And, or uh, moving out. Sorry, not moving out. I, I probably should be moving out of your parents' house at some point. You definitely don't want to live <laughs> there forever. Although yep. your dad's house is pretty nice. I might have, I I might know, have stayed I there for a long period of time. I can honestly say I think moving out of my parents' house was like a huge mistake, you know, mm. but at the same time, a great move because we would have killed each other by now. You know, just throwing <laughs> it out there. But Absolutely. No, it's... So, uh, sorry, you were going to say? Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say it's... it's it, it really is one of those things. I think it's really dependent on the area you live too, right? Like, so me, I live in Nanaimo, right? Our average house price is significantly lower than Vancouver, Toronto. It's it's probably lower than Calgary and Edmonton. But, you know, it's it's getting up there. But it's one of those things where, you know, I mean, if we look at how people are moving around and stuff, you know, for a long time, with rates being so low and all this sort of stuff, I think there was a level of, um, I don't want to say spoiled, but we were spoiled with mortgage rates, right? Allowing us to qualify for more stuff, allowing us to do more things. Now we've got some stress test rates that come in and stuff like that. And I think what we need to look at when it comes to people buying houses and buying their first house, maybe you're not buying that house downtown Vancouver. Maybe you're not buying in one of the nicer locations. Maybe you're not buying in Victoria. Maybe you're not buying in Nanaimo. Maybe you're buying in those outlying areas. Like, for example, we've got Lanceville and Duncan and all these places around us where you can actually see the house price. Same house, but it's cheaper. And it just means an extra 25 minutes, half an hour on your commute. Yeah, which is nothing. Yeah. Especially when a lot of people are, are now able to work from home uh, part of the oh, time. Oh, totally. Right? So, okay. So we've, we've, we've beat this to death. It's yep. obvious the net worth numbers <laughs> just tell the story. We don't need to, we don't need to do anything else other than that. Just look at the numbers of Canadians who have rented versus owned and what the financial benefit is. So now the next step is, okay, we, we definitely know we need to buy. Now we need to figure out the first part of this whole process, which is <laughs> the down payment piece. Yep. How do we save the down payment? Now, I'm glad. I, 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 I kind of wish Greg was here. I'm kind of <laughs> glad he's not because this is where it goes. You just go to the bank of mom and dad and it's like, well, it's not yeah. possible for everybody. No. And I just love that he keeps saying that because when he starts to see the comments on the uh on the YouTube channel of this podcast, he's going to see that that's not <laughs> the best option for everybody. 
Oh, um, totally. But down payment. So this is something that you probably need to start thinking about years before you actually find yourself in a position mm -hmm. to buy a home. And there's some really great ways to save for this and some really great tax advantages as well that can help you save the money a lot faster than what people ever thought was possible, right? So um, let's talk a little bit about those. Start start me up with you know, what your first step would be to save for a down payment. So for me, the first step is it, it it's a budget. That's mm -hmm. always been the first step. And then the next step would be the RSPs because they kind of tie in together. But like knowing exactly how much money you have coming in and how much you're spending and where money's going is incredibly crucial because if you don't know what if if you're not tracking your money i mean i'm sure there's lots of people like me out there if i don't track my money and know what i'm bringing in what i need i will spend it mm -hmm. it will be gone and when someone looks at me and says well where'd all your money go i <laughs> i don't know right <laughs> so i always tell like a lot of uh any of my friends or young people or cousins and stuff that are starting to try and get into the spot where they're going to buy a home i look at them and say the first thing you need to do is set up a budget set up not even necessarily a budget but know how much money you have coming in and know what you need to spend per month and we've even built out like an excel spreadsheet that thank god it does all the math for you because i may be a mortgage broker but i hate math and mm -hmm. it um you just fill in what you spend per month you fill in your monthly income it gives you totals gives you at the annual total at the end right and by utilizing that you can say okay i'm technically at the end of the year i've got five grand burning a hole in my pocket what do I do with that? How do I use this to maximize saving for a down payment? And if you're a first time home buyer, depending on tax brackets and all this stuff, but if you put it in something like an RSP where you get a tax return, mm -hmm. well, you put it in that RSP, you use that, you can use that for your down payment later on down the road, but you're also getting that tax back in regards to it, allowing you to allocate that towards the savings as well. Yeah. And quite honestly, that's the fastest way to get a down payment is to pile as much money into an RSP as you possibly can. Yep. get the tax uh, refund as a result, pile that back in and then let it all grow. I mean, that's like, that's the down payment accelerator that when people go, man, saving that 5% or that 20%, if yeah. you want to go down that road is really difficult. Well, there's some really easy ways to accelerate it. And there's one time outside of a mortgage that I'll tell somebody that they should go and get a loan. And that is when they're going to buy a house in the next three to five years They've got RSP room and they have trouble actually saving their money. And yep. what I'll tell people is go and get an RSP loan from the bank. Uh, you'll get a pretty low interest rate on it and you're going to make the contribution. You're going to make it right away and then you're going to get a refund. But every single month, you're also going to have to make the payment on the loan, which is basically like a forced savings account. And the interest yeah. rates on these things are really, really good. So, I think you do that and you say, okay, I'm going to go to $10,000 RSP loan. I'm going to learn how to have to make a monthly payment every single month. I'm going to have that $10,000 now growing in the RSP. I'm going to get probably a $3,000 refund check from the, from the government. And then all of a sudden in one year, I've got $13,000 saved up for down payment. And yeah. then I go and do it again the next year. And the Which next I year. It's funny too, because like that's been taught to me by my dad. That's something he's been doing for years and years and years. And I mean, if we go past the down payment thing, it's um one of those things where you use that for saving for retirement too, right? Because I mean, if we look at it, saving for your down payment, I think you should start thinking about down payment at the same time you start thinking about retirement. And you should be doing that at the age of 17 or 18. Yeah, 100%. Like honestly, it's 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 a fact. And it's, I'll, go, um, I'll, I'll go one step further than that. Yeah. Our, our son, our 10-year-old son has an app called Mido. And you know, I'll, I don't love RBC for mortgages. Um, I think I've made that clear <laughs> on, my, on, on, on my YouTube channel. But I love them for two things. One is commercial banking. And then yep. the other is this Mido app, which is freaking amazing. And uh, RBC, this one's on me before the sponsorship. You're going to get the, the shout out for free. This is not <laughs> sponsored by RBC. I'm not, but the app is so cool because what I'm able to do is I'm able to give my kid tasks like he has a job. He has to do certain things to get his allowance. And then when he goes to spend money, he they actually send him a little credit card. And he, uh, in order to spend the money, he has to put at least the amount that he's spending in the savings. So we've got him yep. on a 50% save rate at 10 years old. And eventually wow. that's going to have to come down. Maybe it won't. Maybe he'll be lucky and, he, and it won't. But he's starting from 10 years old knowing that I'm supposed to save 50% of my money for... wow something down the road he doesn't even know what he's saving for yet he he just knows that i've set him a target to save a hundred dollars 
And his goal is to get to a hundred dollars. And he's like, well, what am I going to use it for? And I, I'm like, I have no idea, but you'll be glad you have it. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think that's just, just ingraining it early and then, and then, mm -hmm. you know, getting, and when people start renting, when people start living on their own, they, they really should be looking at their budgets and saying not, well, here's my expenses. Do I have any left? But they, when they go to look at their rent and they go to look at buying, they should be looking at that going, if I rent this property or if I buy this property, am I going to be able to continue to save that 20 or 25% of my income that I know yeah. I should be saving? And then you build your lifestyle off of that rather than going, well, I've got that extra 25%. Maybe I'll just spend it all and get a nicer house, right? Yep. Well, and then... That's um, what's that? I can't remember who said it, but it was uh, the pay yourself first thing, right? And okay. I mean, that's um, something that me and my wife abide by is a certain portion of every single check goes into a savings account. Yeah. Before anything is paid, before the mortgage is paid, before, before anything, that portion is allocated into where it needs to go for our savings, which is part of our RRSP contribution, our ESP for children, all sorts of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's something like that stuff that's not taught in school which drives mm -hmm. me absolutely nuts. I mean, I'm I'm blessed because my dad has been working in mortgages for 30 years, so he knows this stuff like the back of his hand, and he taught me all of this. But, you know, I talked to friends about it. I had one friend, we were uh, out on a trip, and she wanted to buy something, but she's trying to save money. And I said, well, if you buy that, like, do you have cash for that in hand? Like, you're not putting it on credit. She said, yeah, I've got the money for it. And I'm like, okay, do you have enough money to buy it twice? And she says, well, no. And I'm like, then don't buy it such a good right piece like of advice it's if you buy it now you're dipping into your savings right yeah yeah so why not save up for it save that money so you can buy it twice and then buy it yeah. and then you have the money in your savings it's 100%. not going anywhere 100 percent. if you can't if you can't buy it twice don't buy it at all i love that yeah. piece of advice <laughs> and then obviously there's tfsa you yep. don't get the same you get growth advantages with the tfsa um, you don't get the same refund advantages. Um, and then there's the new first time yes. home buyers savings account, which is absolutely amazing. You can't, to my knowledge, you can't do the, the loan piece that I talked about with that yet. Yeah. Somebody will come out with that product. Um, but if you've got money and you want to put it aside, I think that's the best combination of the RSP and the TFSA because you get the tax refund like you would get with the RSP mm -hmm. and then you get the tax-free growth like you would get with the TFSA. And unlike the RSP first-time home buyers account, you don't have to pay it back yeah. into the first-time home. Man, they made these really bad. Uh, I know, there's too many acronyms. Really, anyways, so RSP, <laughs> you have to pay back over 15 years. First-time yep. home buyer savings account uh, thing, you don't have to pay it back. You just get to use it once and then it's done. Yeah. Right? So I think, you know, if I had to, I had to give advice um i would say if you're not going to use an rsp loan use the first time home buyer savings account first yeah then the rsp and then the tfsa and then once you bought a house tfsa first rsp second right yep okay so we, we've now figured out we need the down payment we need a budget we need all of those things the next step is you're going to need a mortgage Two questions to this. First is broker or bank. The second part of this question is when do you start talking to a broker or a bank? Um, I'm just going to take the broker versus bank question <laughs> because this is really easy. It's it's here. You know what? We're even going to go. We're going to go second angle on this. We're going to look right at the camera and we're going to say it's 2023. When you get a mortgage, you don't have to go in and talk to a salesperson. You can have somebody represent you and your best interest <laughs> who has significantly more options than the bank. This is obvious. It's broker. Like, there's no question about this. There's no <laughs> debate. It's And it's 2023 when somebody says, well, but you want everything all in one place. It's like, well, do you go to your bank for a gym membership so you can see it on your online banking portal? No. You're going to get a portal for your mortgage if you get it somewhere else. It's the biggest financial decision you'll ever make. So get your mortgage from the place that has the absolute best options and from somebody who represents you. So rant over. Now let's talk about the second piece of this. I just want to is... say quick, that second camera angle is like, you just peered right into my soul. When I was looking at that screen. <laughs> That's I felt like point. I was That's in school and in trouble. I was like, Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've never used that on the podcast before either. Like no, it's always that was, there. That was gold. It's, it's that was amazing. Funny. 
it's one button. It's just we go here, we go here. You can see I've got my little. Oh, I didn't even realize I had my little light string going in that. But oh, you know, you're gonna get okay. a little bit of extra behind the scenes action on exactly. That, uh, they on can that see all the angle, but... all the workings in the back end there. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, that's the easy question. And then the question that I'll pose to you, is, or the easy answer, the question I'll pose to you is: When do you start having that conversation with your broker or your bank? Well, it's for me, I've always said as soon as possible. Like if you're thinking about buying or thinking about anything, talk to your broker. It's um, there's no cost. Like mm -hmm. you, you're not going to pay me to sit down and take half an hour of my time and build out an idea. And I think sometimes what you find is people hold themselves back a bit. Like, oh no, I can't do it. There's no way, right? And then they come in. And it's like, no, you you can qualify to buy a house today, and they look completely shocked. Or there's people where they, you know. Oh, I can't do it. There's no way you sit down. It's like, well, actually in 12 months, if we follow this strategy and this plan and this idea, yes, yes, you can. Yeah. So I've always said to people, it's when, when you feel emotionally and financially like buying a house in either now or the future is what you want to do. Talk to a broker. Totally. And I can, and I can't agree with you more. And as a broker, right. I want you to come to me as soon as you're thinking about it. Yeah. Because I'll be able to help you set up a plan. If there's anything on your credit that you weren't aware of, I'll be yep. able to help you fix that. And I'm going to be able to tell you about the blind spots you might have, like using an RSP versus trying to save it penny by penny yourself, right? If I can help get you there faster, if you want to get there faster, then absolutely, let's do that. And maybe you're in a position where you're five years out because you decided you want to be five years out. You should still be going once you've decided that a home is in your future. And I hope after you saw the numbers from stats Canada on, on net worth <laughs> that you've now decided that your home is in the future. Um, but once you've decided that that's in the future, go and have that conversation and make sure that you're doing everything right, right from the get go, rather than waiting until, uh, waiting until, you know, you're three months out and then finding out, Oh, if you yeah. did a whole bunch of other stuff, you could have made the whole process a heck of a lot cheaper or better. Right. Like, um, well, we're like, not scary. Like we don't bite. No, you know. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's it's. I, I had one customer who was. It was actually a friend of mine, and they were so nervous about sitting down. Hey, let's get real personal with it. My wife, when we bought a house together, she was terrified of me seeing her credit. Absolutely terrified. She Ooh. she was sitting there in the home office when I clicked to run the credit bureau. And she's just shaking like a leaf. And I'm like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. And her credit score came back and all the stuff came in. And of course, we had already previously discussed like what our financial stuff looked like because we were at that stage in the relationship. And, you know, her score was fine. I'm like, you had nothing to be worried about. She's like, I was so scared because, you know, if my beacon score is an 800, it's not good. I'm like, no, no, 800 is amazing. I'm a mortgage <laughs> broker and mine is an 800. Like, chill, you're good. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I, it's, one I of think things. like credit score is like a third date conversation myself. <laughs> That's all like, right. Third date. We've gone for a movie. We've gone for dinner. Now it's dinner and drinks. And what's your credit score? <laughs> Two pieces of photo ID, please. Well, I, I mean, think of it this way, right? Like, you know, I'm going to make, I'm going to make romance real awesome here. You go and you apply for a job nowadays. Like they usually pull your credit and they usually yeah. pull your credit because they want to know if you're responsible. Um, third, second date, fourth. I don't. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> second date is the credit bureau one. Okay, okay. Thank God I'm married though, because now I don't have to go through that anymore. Yeah, and definitely before <laughs> you pop the question, you should know a little bit about oh, your. Yeah. Uh, oh uh, yeah. The number of times that you have that we've had clients over the years oh. that are sitting across the table and they don't know about something that's on the other's credit bureau is has been amazing. Like it's always the facial me. expression too. Mm -hmm. Like you run the credit and you tell them what it looks like. And there's that one person on that call, like mm -hmm. if it's a video call and you can mm -hmm. see their face, just it's not disappointment. It's not anger and it's not shock. It's something completely different. And it's along the lines of this. Yeah. Like just completely out of it. I've, I've Yeah. <laughs> little, little bit, a little bit of embarrassment there, right? Yeah. A little bit of life advice at this point, too. If, if, if you're with someone and you're going to buy a house with them or get married, talk about your finances. Mm hmm. It's it's scary, yes, but it's so good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about your goals and your dreams and your aspirations yes. too, because the other person doesn't have any. Uh, that's yeah, a money what, problem. What's your goals happen, and right? dreams in life? Netflix and a couch? Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Exactly. Okay, so <laughs> 
pre-approvals. This is like, this is the first step, uh, getting pre-approved. Where do you want to go on this one? I mean, we can talk about 60 second pre-approvals. We can talk about full <laughs> pre-approvals. We can talk about uh, rate holds. What do you think? I think, it, I think there's a, I think describing what an actual pre-approval is, is important. Okay. <laughs> I think some people seem to think that like, oh, I've talked to my broker. They've got my documents. They've got my application. I'm pre-approved. I'm going to get the mortgage. No problem. There's no no worries at all. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Lenders got to approve the house too. CMHC may have to look at your file. You know, there's all these different scenarios. And CMHC, um, the insurers don't do pre-approvals. So they if do not. Twenty percent down. They get to make the final call. Yep, it's a and, rate hold. That's mm -hmm. all it is. Right. They, and that's they pretty much what all pre-approvals are, is yeah. all rate holds, right? And and what you gotta understand is a pre-approval is not a license to go and write an unconditional offer. Unconditional offer, offer yeah. No, no matter what your that. realtor tells you. There's a Chris <laughs> rock, rock joke in there somewhere, right? No matter yep. what your realtor tells you, you can't that's not not your license to do that. And and pre-approval, pre-qualification, um, some people will t say this one's better than the other. The other will say that the other one's better than the other. The The terms are interchangeable. And yeah. one is not better than the other because if you go to different people, they'll call they'll call a fully underwritten pre-approval a pre-qualification. And then you go to somebody else and they call that a pre-approval, right? So yep. here's what you need to know about pre-approvals. You need to have provided your documents yes. to the broker or the lender or the bank if you really if you didn't pay attention and <laughs> you need to provide your documents they need to be looked at and they need to be verified and then you've got a pre-approval that's got a high likelihood of getting to the approval stage but you've literally just got a rate hold and there's yep. that piece that you mentioned there miles which is the property piece that is so important and mm -hmm. there's also all the checks right it's it's if it's going to be insured the insurer is probably going to do a little bit more due diligence on you. Um, the bank might end up doing a little bit more due diligence on you. So really you're getting this pre-approval and hopefully you're getting a rate hold and then you're, you're going out to find a home. And once you found a home, that's when the approval process starts. Yep. And it's not until the approval process starts that you find out if you're actually going to get money. Now you mentioned rate hold. Tell me about, tell me about a rate hold. Well, rate hold is uh, essentially here's my application. Here's what I, to have um and they will hold the rate for 90 120 days depending on the lender and that's basically securing you so that if rates do increase you get the lower of the two because you've got that rate hold but at the end of the day with a rate hold it, unless you mentioned it earlier if, if a lender or a broker or someone has not reviewed all your documents and i'm not talking like oh here's a t4 and a paste up no i'm talking job letter t4 paste up notice of assessment bank statements if we don't have a full application and a full file, mm -hmm. your pre-approval is not really worth the paper it's written on, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And that's mm -hmm. just basically because until we've vetted all that information, we can't guarantee the lender is going to sign off on it. We know what we're looking for. Yeah. We'll be able to say like, hey, your job letter says you work an average of, you know, what does this mean? Do we need to do a two-year average? Mm -hmm. So having all the documents in is really important. And then we can send it in for that pre-approval or rate hold or whatever you want to call it and get that rate secured but at the end of the day you still have to get that full approval from the bank they still need to sign off on everything to get you the full approval that's why the word pre is in there yeah. it's pre approval yeah and a rate hold doesn't or a pre approval doesn't mean you have necessarily a rate hold because there's a lot of no. lenders that don't do rate holds yeah there's a lot of there's a trend towards brokers now not doing rate holds there they is yeah don't, they don't want to take the time to go and secure the rate and protect you from rising interest rates because there's too much trouble or maybe there's too much liability if they yeah. miss something. So they're just, and and especially with these like online brokerages and these, and some of these like more trendy mortgage companies that you see advertising during the uh, NHL playoffs, um, not DLC group, which I belong to, but um, they're, they're just saying, no, we're not, we're not doing it. We're not hedging the money. We're not doing rate holds. You you basically can do a pre-approval with us, but if rates go up, you get whatever the rate is on the day yeah. that you write the offer. So make sure you have clarity as a consumer about whether or not you've actually got a rate hold that's protecting you in case interest rates jump by like 5% in yeah. eight months, right? Like, Yeah. 
Well, before. that's that's one of the things that we focus on too in our office, right? Is um, you know, we'll get an application, we'll get all your documents in, we get the credit bureau run, and we have it saying that we're like, okay, we'll send out your report. This is what you're approved for. This is what you can do. This is what the payments look like. All this stuff. Um, the joys of being a mortgage broker is we have so many lender options, and we also have really great relationships with these lenders. So, if rates are going to go up, chances are they're going to give us a little bit of a heads up. Mm -hmm. Then we send you in, right? Because the you know, I mean, are we really going to send you in for that rate holder pre qualification at a higher interest rate when rates are down? Yeah. Right. So in times when, and that's where you know working with people you want to work with, I guess is the easiest yeah. way to say it. Yeah. You know, when it comes to pre-approvals and pre-qualifications and everything like that, work with someone who's going to actually work with you and tell you what you're getting, why you're getting it, and what they're going to do if things change. Yeah, totally. Right. Because it's great yeah. advice there. Okay. So now we've got we've got the pre-approval in place. We've made sure that we have a rate hold because we're smart consumers. We're not dealing with the bank. We're dealing with the broker. <laughs> and we're going to the approval stage. When does this trigger? So the approval stage triggers when you've written an offer and when you've got that property in place and now you're going to the actual lender to get the actual approval. Uh, what's important here, Miles? Documents. 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 So you've given documents. all the you've given all your documents. <laughs> now they're probably going to ask you for some more, more documents. <laughs> right. They might ask you to update your previous documents. If yep. you've got a job letter that's more than 30 days old, they might say, Hey, can you go and get a new one? Right. Recent pay stubs. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yep. Now, well, if you've one... done this right, if you've provided all your documents up front, this is actually going to be a pretty painless pretty process. process. Yeah. But if you've gone to a 60 second pre approval <laughs> or you've gone to a or you've gone to a lender or a broker who doesn't ask for your documents up front, this is probably going to be that that most painful week of your life. Yeah. When you get the list of documents that you need now that you actually need to get them and you have a deadline of seven days from now. I've always 10. told I've always told people like get your documents up front. Like I tell other brokers this too, right? If I hear about a broker who's not getting docs up front, I won't tell people what they're approved for until I have their documents because mm -hmm. I can't logically tell you what you're approved for if I don't know. That's and true. when it comes to the subject removal date, that's for dotting your I's and crossing your T's. It's not for, you know, writing out the entire paragraph, mm -hmm. right? So if you get all, like you said, if you get all your documents up front, it's pretty smooth sailing. But if you wait, and if you don't get your documents in and you write an offer before having documents in and stuff like that, it can get really stressful really quickly because now it's not just getting those documents. It's like you said, you've got a timeline, you've got subject removals, you've got that added pressure. And as we all know, you know, gathering those documents when you kind of have, you know, it's a little easier going, it's not so bad. But the moment you put that pressure on and you start to sweat a little, it, it sucks. <laughs> totally. Because on top of that, you're going to have not only those documents you need to get, but you're probably going to need to get condo documents if you're buying a condo, mm -hmm. strata documents. You're probably going to need an appraisal if you're putting more than 20% down. Not probably, but maybe. Yep. You're also almost certainly going to have a home inspection in those yes. in that period of time. And anything that comes up on the home inspection is going to have to be dealt with by not just the realtor, but also by potentially the lender. If it's over, mm -hmm. let's say, $1,000, you got to tell the lender, hey, there's a $1,000 issue. We might have to change something on the purchase contract. So that's all got to be signed off by the uh, the lender as well. So there's a lot of moving parts in in this time frame. And if you have a really great broker, you're not going to realize the amount of things that can potentially go wrong in this period of time. But if you don't have a really great broker who had all your documents up front, um, you're going to be just as stressed as they are. Now, this is like yep. like like I said... This is where a broker really comes into play because their job, if they manage it well, is to make sure your stress levels are very, very, very low. And if they do it well, you're paying for two things, representation and you're paying for the reduction in stress. And when I say you're paying, I mean the bank's paying or the lender's paying typically. There's yeah. no added cost to you. Um, now, that, that gets into a really interesting conversation I love to have with people because they say, well, I'm paying for the mortgage, so I'm ultimately, ultimately paying or the broker as well. And it's like, well, yeah, kind of, except yeah, in a weird way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, technically you're paying for everything, no matter where you get your mortgage from. Cause if you get it from a bank, you're paying for the bricks and mortar, you're paying for the yep. tellers, you're paying for the cleaner, you're paying for everything. When a lender pays a broker 
they're actually paying the brokers because it's cheaper for them than having a branch network or something like that, yeah. right? So in reality, you're getting a you're typically getting a really competitive rate, but the thing you're really getting is representation at around the same cost as if you were to get your mortgage at somewhere where you don't have representation like yeah. a bank, right? Well, and it's, you know, I mean, going back to that bank versus broker thing, um, you know, if you go to, let's say, I don't know, we were talking about RBC before for those accounts and stuff, but um, mm -hmm. let's say you go to RBC, what are they going to give you? What are they going to offer you? RBC. That's mm -hmm. it. Come to a broker. Well, we've got what? Over 50 different lenders we can chat with. I mean, we don't, of yeah. course, talk to all of them because that would be insane, but you have choices. And I think when it comes to getting approvals back, you know, we were talking about like, you know, the first step is documents and like making sure all our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed. But the second step should always be what sort of lender are you working with? Mm -hmm. What sort of lender is providing this approval? And what are the details of that approval? What is the fine print of it? What's all the stuff in there? And RBC isn't going to tell you, you know, hey, First Nationals product is better. They're not going to tell you that. Mm -hmm. We will. It's 100%. part of our job. <laughs> and and that kind of leads into a, another piece of that approval process is which lender are you choosing and yeah. are you choosing the lender or is your broker choosing the lender because i believe in a good broker process the broker guides guides the process the let yep. the client makes the decisions so i really feel like a client should be presented with options and then yep. go i want first national or i want mcap or maybe i want rbc but when yep. they make that decision, they should be making that decision because they know the differences. Exactly. And if the job is done correctly, they'll be able to make that choice by knowing exactly why they're making it. And that's, you know, I mean, that's a major focus to if there's any other brokers watching this. Mm -hmm. um, a, a shocking stat I learned was, um, I can't remember how long ago, but it was CMHC did the information on how many people actually knew what they signed when they signed their mortgage. And the amount of people that actually knew what they were signing and knew what their mortgage looked like was st embarrassingly low embarrassing oh, wow. and that was like you know i was relatively early into my career as a mortgage broker and i made a conscious decision i'm like i want my clients to know basically their mortgage as well as i know it right i want them to fully understand why they picked it why it's there why it's better and all these different things i want them to know if i pay this mortgage out in three years what's my penalty going to be i want them to know you know is there an option to blend and extend? Like all these different things. I want them to understand that. And I want them to know how to talk to the lender too. Because a lot of people would say like, um, I, in this report, there were people that would say, you know, they'd say, who's your lender? Who's your bank? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? They just didn't know. So it's it's something to be said about the approval process as well is having someone who's going to not only provide you, you know, options and provide you the mortgage, but provide you as much information as possible, allowing you to fully understand exactly what you're signing and getting into. Because it's it's a five year contract with a twenty five to thirty year loan. That's a long term relationship. Hundred percent. Your past date too at that point. Oh, lives know? about half of all marriages, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that takes us into that next step and understanding what you're signing, and that's the the closing process. Because to here, you've gone, you've selected your lender. Mm -hmm. You've reviewed all your documents. You got the okay to waive your financing conditions from your broker. Realtor goes ahead, waives your financing conditions, and then everybody starts sending everything to your lawyer. And the lawyer is going to go through the mortgage documents with you. They're going to hopefully explain the mortgage documents uh, to you. They're going to go through the land transfer stuff that transfers yep. the property from the previous owner to you. And Basically, all this is going to happen in the last seven days before. Uh, yeah, it's pretty quick. Yep. So, you know, it's if if done well, it's super easy. There, we have um, we have an episode that you can find on the, the channel from uh, Tony Spagnolo, who's mm -hmm. the single best lawyer in BC for um, for doing real estate transactions, and the reason why is because he has made this seamless and easy. Mm -hmm. And and he talked about great service and creating a great experience and and making sure people, you know, didn't have things go wrong and if they did, minimizing the damages, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this is like this is probably the fastest part of the process, and 
it's the part right before the excitement of actually getting the home. And if you have a great lawyer who's hopefully recommended to you by your realtor or your mortgage broker, this is really easy. Now, the, the mistake, I don't know if you guys see it out in BC as much. The mistake we see people make is when they have a buddy or a family member who practices a different type of law. Yep. And this is where things like go insanely, awfully wrong. They're like, oh, real estate's easy. No problem. I'll take care of that transaction. <laughs> Just filing a couple of documents and everything else. But they know nothing about the real property reports. They know nothing about um, about how to actually close the transactions and the things that can go wrong. And and like I said, this is when um, this is when things just get real bad, right? I've always said if you're going to work with a solicitor at the end, like, well, you have to mm-hmm. pick someone who works in real estate law. Like, pick, pick someone who knows what they're doing with that. Whether it's a notary, whether it's a lawyer, as long as you got a solicitor, and that's what they do. That's their that's their thing. Or mm-hmm. in their office, they have someone that that is what they do. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, for example, you might go to law office X, Y, Z, and the main guy there works in criminal law, but they have someone that does all the real estate stuff for them. That's mm-hmm. who you want to work with. Right. And I mean, that's where during the closing process, like, you know, I mean, there's a couple of things you want to look at house insurance, um, the notary or solicitor or lawyer you're going to work with um, all these different scenarios. And that's where working with someone who knows these people, too, because sometimes it's not what you know, it's who, you know. I mean, any of our customers is going to receive that information. This is who we think you should talk to for your legals. This is someone you can talk to about your house insurance. This is someone you should talk to about life and disability insurance. If you don't have any, because you just bought a house, you should Mm -hmm. be covered. Um, You know, having those people to talk to is going to be really important. It's crucial Mm because like you said, it's so close to that. uh, You know, I've I've seen it happen where I'm going to work with my brother's sister's aunt's cousins, twice removed, whatever. Uh, because they're going to do it for cheaper. And then days before the closing date, something gets brought up or something happens. And then I'm on the phone with the, the lawyer trying to tell them how to do their job and how to mm-hmm. move things along. And it just, it does. It can get really messy and muddled when it didn't need to. And that just, it's not that it's going to, usually it never blows stuff up, but it does add that extra stress to you as the buyer yeah. where you just went through that entire stressful process of getting to this point you don't need any more stress on your shoulders. Totally. You should be just signing stuff, having a brief conversation, getting your keys, unlocking your door, moving into your home. Yeah. And sometimes the uh, sometimes the $500 savings um, creates the $10,000 problems, right? Yep. And, and a lot of people don't realize this, but the one of the hardest things about doing a, a transaction on, on real estate is figuring out who owes who what money. Yeah. Because there can be... There can be taxes that were previously yep. paid by the previous owner. There could be penalties that maybe need to be paid to um, a lender. There could be penalties that are maybe being rebated back if somebody's supporting their mortgage. Like the math is complicated. And I would say once a week in our office, we have somebody who does real estate law who sends us an email or sends a client an email with messed up numbers. And yeah. they and they do it every single day. But it's like, it's the mass hard and, and getting yep. it right is, is so important. So this is, but I mean, to round out the closing um, process here, basically everything gets sent to the lawyer, everything uh, gets signed at the lawyer. And then once the bank sends the money to the lawyer and the lawyer sends it to the other lawyer, then you get your keys to the house, right? Yeah. All the money moves back and forth. That's when you get the keys to the house. Now the question is what happens post-closing? <laughs> <laughs> this is the often not thought about part of buying a house and getting a mortgage. What happens post closing? Well, I'll tell you first and first thing you want to make sure the payment comes out of your bank account in the first yep. month. And by the way, if you did end up choosing a mortgage at a place that isn't your main bank and you chose a date that your first payment should come out, it's probably not going to be reflected in your account until like two days after yeah. the date, right? Because what ends up happening is People say, well, I want my payment to happen on Friday the 19th. And that's when the lender requests the money. But let's say they're requesting the money. You got a Scotiabank mortgage. This is what we have. I'm not, maybe I shouldn't say it like that. <laughs> so if you want to steal my identity, here's all my information. <laughs> but let's say you had again, a, Nolan? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure somebody's got it. Uh, so you go to, you go to Scotiabank. And Scotiabank requests the money because that's where your mortgage is. And let's mm-hmm. say they're requesting it from CIBC. 
Well, CIBC isn't actually going to send them the money until probably a day later. Yeah. And then that's when it's going to show up in your bank account. So your payment date and when your bank actually sends the money can be different days and they're usually a day or two apart. So like for us, uh, we know that the lender requested on Friday and then the money comes out of our bank account on Monday. Yeah. And that's, but the key thing here is you want to make sure that the money is coming out yeah. within a couple of days of when it's supposed to. And if you go like 35 days and no, and the money hasn't come out, you need to make sure that that's fixed. Well, and there's a, uh, I always tell people too, like it's a, uh, if you don't see the money come out, um, they aren't giving you a, a free month. It's it's it it's not good luck. Phone them, give them their money because if you don't, they're going to hit you with fees and stuff like that too. And the other big thing I tell people too is the property tax account. Yep. If you look at your payment and you elected to have the lender cover your property taxes, and you look at your payment and that's not included, you need to get in touch with them as soon as possible, or even phone your broker, right? Because we can always help facilitate this sort of thing, but. Get in touch with someone, be it your bank or broker, to get make sure that that property tax account is set up. Because the last thing you want is property tax time to come around and not have the money for it. Because you have to pay it. Totally. 100%. Uh, and it, and if you don't, it's like, oh, I have a $5,000 expense that I thought I paid already. And yep. yeah, it's so, I mean, that's important too. And then now you've started this five-year journey of having your mortgage. There's a couple other things you need to think about. You need to think about what happens if I accidentally miss a payment. Yep. And you need to think about what happens if rates go down? So if you miss a payment, I'll take uh, I'll take what happens if you miss a payment. You take what happens if rates go down. Um, if you miss a payment, you basically got a 30-day window to make that payment up before it hurts your credit. Because you don't end up in an R2, I guess it's an M2 situation because we're talking about mortgages. An M2 would mean that you're 30 days late, but you don't end up having a 30-day late hit on your credit bureau until you're actually 30 days late. Yeah. And just so you guys know, the bank's not going to call you on day 29 and say, hey, you still owe us that payment. They're going to call you on day 31 after the damage is already done. We had this happen this last year. We had a mortgage that it was two banks involved. Maybe not, And now maybe I'm going to make the case for why you should have everything in one place, but this was like a freak thing that shouldn't <laughs> happen. But we, we gave our uh, our brother, my brother and sister-in-law, um, a loan for their de uh, deposit on the house they were buying because they had a whole bunch of their money tied up in the existing property. And rather than going to like a secondary lender and paying um, loan shark fees in order to just have like a deposit for 30 days, we just cut them a check. And then when the lawyer sent us the money back after the fact, we deposited it. And then the bank that we were dealing with I'm trying to say, decide whether I want to say who that bank was, but the <laughs> bank that the bank where the account was, they put a $20,000 hold on our account. So there's money in there. Yep. All the money, like there's $20,000 and it's a $400 loan payment. And what happens when you, when you go into overdraft on your bank account is the, the manager on the teller side, at every single bank has to go through and review the people whose accounts are in overdraft. So they have a negative balance and they tend to use reason. So if you've got a good relationship with your bank and you, they know that you've got the money or if they have a $20,000 hold on your account and you've got the money, but it's on hold, typically what they'll do is they'll say, okay, this one, that person definitely doesn't have the money. So we're going to send the money back or we're, we're going to send the, send the request for the payment back. But this guy has the $20,000. There's just a hold in the account. So we're just going to lift the hold for whatever the payment amount is. Well, for whatever reason, the bank that we deal with didn't do that, sent the payment back. I've also got 3 million people a year who watch my YouTube channel and know that I, ha I like Scotiabank mortgages. So a lot of people know that I've got a Scotiabank mortgage. And mm -hmm. we start getting these phone calls saying, hey, you missed a payment, you missed a payment, you missed a payment. And we're going, okay, that seems a little scammy. So I get Jen, my wife, to call the bank. And they say, on a number that is not the number that they called me from to tell me that I missed a payment because I don't know if that number is real. And by the yep. way, when you Googled that number, it showed up as this is a scam number. It was the collections <laughs> department at Scotiabank. 
And basically, she calls and they say there's nothing wrong with the account. Turns out there was something wrong with the account, but they couldn't see it yet. Yeah. So what ends up happening is on day 31, I get a number from a different Scotiabank number. It actually shows as Scotiabank rather than just a random 800 number. And it's a real person on the other end. And it actually is, we missed that, missed that payment. So I have no idea where I was going with that whole long <laughs> story, except for the fact, all I can think of at this point is, you know, you've got that 30 day period to make sure that it's paid. And if you do notice that you've missed it, do everything you can to pay it, to get, to get it paid. And the best way to do yeah. that, by the way, is not to send it from online banking, but to go directly into your bank or go directly to the lender and give them the money yeah. and have somebody register it there and register that they got it. Um, now, on top of that, the next piece is that what happens if rates go down? Mm. If rates go down, that's, um, and that's something that like, I mean, it, it's always the conversation when you're signing a mortgage is, you know, I mean, what's going to happen with rates? I mean, you're taking a five-year contract. I mean, psh, mm -hmm. years ago we were doing 10-year terms, right? And, um, you know, when rates go down, that's where we want to explore the sort of mortgage you have. And that's why it's so important to work with a mortgage broker. So, mm -hmm. for example, when I prepare a mortgage for a customer, we're talking like, you know, I'm buying a house, whether it's 5, 20% down or whatever. There's two things I'm going to look for in the mortgage, portability and assumability, right? Just to make sure that if you sell your house and buy a house, you can move your mortgage and all this sort of stuff. But the other big thing that I look for, and it's it's almost more important than, in fact, it's probably one of the most important things, penalty structure. If if you're working with a lender... Wait, that's... are we back to the penalty, the big bank conversation again? Is oh that where God. we're going with this? It's looped around, man. It's a vicious cycle. Okay, so we're back to the other, we're back to the other camera lens. We'll make this oh, really boy. clear. Oh, Second boy. angle, the serious angle. He's got if the... You get... <laughs> if you get a five-year fixed mortgage at a big bank and interest rates go down, you will have a massive penalty and you will not have any options. You will not be able to get a lower interest rate because the fact that you have a massive penalty will make it so you can't switch to a different lender. You can't switch to a different lender. It means you don't have any leverage and therefore you're stuck with your higher rate till the end of five years. How's that? That was good. That was good. And now we're back to the nice angle too. The string has the serious a really good effect too, right? It's, it, it, the serious yeah. angle. I like that. You should put a sticker above <laughs> it. It's like serious time or like something. It's yeah, that's gold. But it, it's it, so true though. It, like, I mean, down. sorry. I'm going to get a, I'm going to get another neon light that says pay attention here. <laughs> or we got on air and arrow, important. Right? Yeah. You should no see the kidding. new light I got coming. It's awesome. Oh God. You, I uh, have it. Oh, that's, you see, it's funny too. Cause doing this like, you know, off topic completely, but after the chat, like, cause we had Tom on here and like seeing your room and his room makes me look at mine and go, okay, mm -hmm. what have, what do I do? What do I do? I think I even sent you a message on Facebook about your beautiful bricks in the background and like, you know, yeah. how'd you do that and stuff. So yeah. we'll see. Might have to, Wait. might have to do some painting in here, but we can work you know, on that. Oh yeah. Looping back to the, the, the penalty structure too is like, a lot of people forget that there is something called a collateral transfer, no fee switch, whatever you want to call it. But we can pick your mortgage up, leave the amortization the same, leave the balance the same and move it to a new lender. They're going to cover nine times out of 10, they cover your appraisal and your legals mm -hmm. and they'll capitalize up to $3,000 of costs into the new mortgage. If your penalty is 10 grand, you got to come up with the difference, right? So they're going to capitalize the 3,000. You have to pay the difference out of pocket. Mm -hmm. And if you want to include that in the new mortgage, well, now you're not doing a no fee switch. You're doing a full refinance, which means legal fees, appraisal, you know, all that stuff. And a lot of the times when doing a no fee switch, we can usually get lower interest rates because it's really easy for the bank to make those transactions happen. Mm -hmm. So when you do get your mortgage, I mean, this is looping back to everything, right? Like even the pre-approval process and approvals and everything, make sure you're with a lender that's going to provide you flexibility for the event of changing your mortgage. Even mm -hmm. if you look at it and go, oh no, this is my forever house. I'm never going to move. I'm never going to change. Really? Never. Yeah. Never ever? Like, you know, it's one of those have it and not need it than need it and not have it things. I'd rather have the ability to move my mortgage even if I didn't need it versus needing that and not being able to do it. Totally. 
it's not a set it, set it and forget it thing, right? This yeah. is all about we might have to ride it out for a full five years, but we want yep. options so that we can save money. Because here's, you know, we talked about bank versus broker. Here's the difference between an exceptional broker and an okay broker is any broker, like two days out of the out of the licensing course can save you 0.1%. Yep. That's easy. But a really exceptional broker is going to be able to find you a five, 10, 15, $20,000 swing, probably at least once, maybe more than once. Yep. over the course of your mortgage. And the key thing is lender selection right up front and making sure that you've got a mortgage that gives you the options to take yeah. advantage of lower rates when they come up, right? Yeah. And it's, then... Sorry? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, it's one of those things like, um, you know, the amount of times I've had a first-time homebuyer ask me like, oh, I want to work with Scotiabank or, or, or TD because those are my banks. And I'm like, okay, hear me out. That's great. They're your bank. I love that. Have you seen the penalty structure between the two? This is your first home. Um, I don't know if the stats are still the same, but when I first started, statistically speaking, a first-time home buyer is going to move in three years. You're mm-hmm. going to break that contract term. You're going to pay a penalty. Like, sorry, I keep uh, peeking the filter here. Um, you're going to end up paying that penalty. So if we can set you up with a mortgage where you know that, yes, you might stay there for five years. Great. Life is good. But if you did want to move in three years, mm-hmm. you can. That's huge. That's hugely important. And it it boils down to the fact of, once again, coming back to, you know, unpredictability, not having a crystal ball, not being able to see into the future. You don't know what's going to happen in five years. It's a long time. You may have to move. And aren't you going to be super pissed off if the lender you worked with or a broker you worked with maybe saved you, I don't know, five, ten bucks a month, but your penalty costs you 20 grand instead of like six? Absolutely. I'm the, just, I mean, it's simple math on that yeah, one, right? <laughs> yeah. The, the savings in a mortgage is in flexibility, not in 0.1% off of 100%. a 5.49 rate, right? Yeah. Okay. So now post-closing, we're not setting in for getting it. We should be probably looking at our mortgage at least once a year to go yep. can I get a better option. Um, put it in your calendar. If you have a broker that does annual reviews, they'll do it automatically for you. Yep. But you definitely want to be looking at this on a pretty regular basis. It's your biggest financial decision you'll ever make. It's your biggest financial liability. You definitely want to be looking for opportunities to save money. Now, when it comes time to renew the mortgage, because you're going to have to do this probably every five years, maybe sooner if you take a shorter term mortgage, but you definitely want to make sure you're doing what, Miles? Phone your broker. Phone your broker. Shop yeah, don't, your mortgage. Yep. Right? If you get that renewal agreement back from your lender, don't sign it. Send it back. Don't phone them. Phone the broker give that piece of paper to the broker and ask their advice. Absolutely. Because key. the number one thing about renewals is the mortgage that you have to, when your mortgage comes up for renewal is probably not the mortgage that you needed five years ago. Yeah. Right. Your, your situation's probably changed. You probably need a different mortgage. You probably have a different plan for the next five years. You want to make sure that you're checking to make sure the lender is still the right lender for you. The product's still the right product. And ultimately, you want to make sure that the rates that they're offering you are significantly better than what a lot of lenders offer on renewal. Yeah. Because there are almost always better rates out there than what they offer you because they know they've had you for five years. They know that signing a piece of paper and just renewing is easy. And a lot of lenders will try to take advantage of that. Now, some will give you a really good deal, but others will just say, oh, well, we'll just try to get them to sign for 1% higher than market rate. Yep. Maybe they won't look at anything and maybe they'll do it. And that's honestly one of the fastest ways to lose a pretty significant amount of money is by not going and looking at other options at least. Well, and I always tie the, uh, like, I tie the renewal process into an annual review process as well. Um, you know, I mean, when you come up for renewal, like right now, you know, if we look at what things are like right now, rates are up, they may go down, they may go, who cares? But let's say you're in a spot where rates are up and they go down when you come up for renewal. Mm-hmm. The first question you should be asking, you shouldn't be getting your renewal agreement going, oh my gosh, my payments went down. Woohoo. You should be looking at that and saying, okay, my payments have gone down. What happens if I keep them the same? Mm-hmm. Is that going to help me pay my mortgage off faster? Or, you know, it's all about that planning process. You know, I mean, when I first got into this industry, my dad always said, we're mortgage planners. And mm-hmm. I'm kind of looked at, I'm like, no, we're mortgage brokers. That's, that's mm-hmm. the job title, right? But it makes sense because we do. We build a plan that's strategically built for you and your situation, not just for the first one, two, three, five years, but for the next 25 years, I mean, 
it's one of those things where you want to have that relationship and you want to have that understanding. And I mean, some people get annoyed. Some people don't want to hear from me on an annual basis. I mean, I talk about mortgages and interest rates. It's not very exciting. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, what's really, really exciting. Rates have gone down. Let's see if we could save you some money and maybe pay your mortgage off five years sooner. That's exciting. And totally. yeah, that's all part of the renewal too, right? Like if you're not exploring those options, you're missing out on opportunity. Absolutely. And then I, I think we have to talk about one last thing about renewals before that we close this whole conversation out. Early renewals. Mm. We see this a lot, right? Yep. Six months, nine months, even sometimes a year out, banks coming and saying, hey, we got a really great deal for you. you should, maybe you should early renew. And sometimes they are good deals. Yep. And sometimes they're not. But usually, usually, if a bank or a lender is reaching out to you directly long before it's time to renew, they're asking you to renew because it's more often in, to their benefit than it is to yeah. yours. And we see this, I've seen this a bunch of times um, with different lenders who are like, oh, if you early renew, you'll get this rate and it's going to be significantly lower. But what they don't tell people is that it's just the normal rate. They're just blending it with your existing rate, yep. which is making it look lower, but you're actually not getting a better deal. You're getting a worse deal than if you just waited it out. And there's always that potential that if you are looking at a renewal a year in advance, you might be in a situation where rates go down. And if rates go down and you early renewed, well, you didn't get to take advantage of that. Yep. So I always look at it this way is early renewals is essentially trying to time the market. And when you try to time a market, you're usually <laughs> wrong. Absolutely. So well, I think I think in that case, riding it out on an early renewal until the until the end is more often than not the the best option. Well, and hear me out on this one too. You know, this is when I wish I had a serious camera where I could just you know but if, where's your zoom it's, button uh, it's it's buried <laughs> under a bunch of other pages uh by the time i find it it'll be 20 minutes i'm sure we don't want to see that um <laughs> but essentially like with a renewal so you get your renewal it's been five years phone your broker mm -hmm. if you get an early renewal who are you gonna phone mm, broker absolutely nice. phone your broker Perfect. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt them. Chances are they're excited to hear from you because you're their client. You know, hey, I just got this in the mail. I want to know what you think about it. You wanted my opinion? Oh, thank you. We love it. Phone your broker. Like oh. if you got questions about your mortgage, renewal, early renewal, switch transfer, whatever, phone your broker. Absolutely. <laughs> Yo, know, I, I think I so far I love this conversation. I think this is probably one of my favorite episodes that uh, that we've done yet. Nice. I think it would be really interesting uh, at some point to bring on somebody from a bank um, and maybe make sure your dad's on that one and, <laughs> and you know, let them have the conversation about, uh, about bank versus broker as well. And, uh, and, and have a real debate about it and, uh, and see who comes out on top because there are perhaps some benefits to having a relationship with your bank and your banker and everything else. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day though, I think, I think, that representation and options really speak loudly. Mm -hmm. And especially when we get to that renewal part, um, understanding knowledge and having somebody who knows what your blind spots are when you may not realize that you even have them is so, so important. And really, if there's one thing that this episode's about is, and what it became about was not so much the mortgage process, but, the representation process and the yeah. knowledge process and and understanding that you do have options and understanding that a really somebody who's got your best interest in mind because they get compensated when they have your best interest in mind is so hugely hugely valuable absolutely yeah absolutely i think I, yeah sorry no nope, go ahead oh okay i was gonna say it, it's kind of funny too because if you look at like the evolution of the broker and the bank and all that sort of stuff if I'm not mistaken, and I could be, because I've been wrong before, um, wasn't there a point in time where there was sort of like, it, it was almost like everyone thought mortgage brokers were like sketchy. Yeah, sketchy. We were the shadow lenders. lenders. You know, we were we were the guys you go to when you can't get a real mortgage because we and, are sketchy. And I, <laughs> and I think there was a point in the 70s where that was absolutely the case. Yep, right? 100%. That was the 70s, though. A lot of other stuff happened in the 70s yep. that... But yeah. this is, it's 2023, and that's that's not the game that most brokers play anymore. Well, and I mean, I, I'm just throwing it out here. I like to think I don't look like a sketchy person. I may have a beard, but, you know, 
I'm that's growing. the 70s thing too right is like if you had a you beard know. in the 70s you weren't yeah trusting. you're sketchy yeah now it's very common i mean you don't even have to know how to split firewood and you can look like a lumberjack nowadays mm -hmm. and i love that because plaid is great and physical exercise sucks throwing <laughs> it out there <laughs> oh i love it i oh, love it man this is why i love doing this show with you guys with both of you guys. Um, <laughs> well, we are missing Greg today. I'd be I'd be remiss if I didn't mention what he was doing. He does apologize that he's not here. Um, you know, it's, it's at our office, it's something we've done for years. We do a Bikes for Kids program where we've mm -hmm. given away like 3,000 bikes to kids in need in our community and stuff. And Greg's trying to get to a point where he can teach other brokers how to do this in their communities and things like that. So he's really trying to grow it. And um, he sent me like four pictures. Three are terrible. One is really good. And I wish I could share them, but we'll... You know, we'll find a way to throw those somewhere. But yeah, no, he's uh, he does apologize that he's not here. It's not because he doesn't want to be here with two millennials, mm -hmm. as he's a boomer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it's not that he doesn't like us because of who we are. It's just that we're younger, and he hates that. But <laughs> he's he's busy out trying to do some uh some good yeah. work out there. So yeah. I've, I gotta throw that in there for the guy. Amazing. No, we we miss him. We miss him for the last two, but we'll uh, yep. we'll catch him on the next one. The nice thing about having three guys on this show is that we've always got the opportunity to have one of them go and do the things that uh, they love and that they're passionate about. Absolutely. And you know, there'll be, there'll be times you're not around and times I'm not around and <laughs> that's what makes it great. Anyways, I mean, thanks little, pals. That no was, worries. <laughs> that was a great conversation. Uh, perhaps the next one will be the actual home buying process. Yeah. Yeah. Wait for that one. Absolutely. All right. Thanks Nolan.